Hello, my name is Kishwani. That's K E S H W A N I. Kishwani. We are here because we want to prepare for GMAT. We have been solving GMAT math problems out of this book here, the GMAT Official Guide 2022. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. Always make sure that the book is in front of you when you're working with me. Today we'll solve some problems that you'll find on page number 137 and 138. The very first problem that you see there on page 137, number 159. In 159 we are told that we have 403 regions. We are further told that there are 98, 98 dealers per region. And that, and, and that each dealer sells on average, each dealer on average sells 2,488 pairs of shoes, pairs of shoes per dealer. The question is very straightforward. The question simply is, what is the approximate pair of shoes that are sold in this franchise? All we have to do is multiply these quantities, and since they are looking for approximate, approximate is exactly what we're going to do here. So 403 is just 400 approximately. Here we have 100. And here we have 2,500. As you can see, the regions wraps out, the dealers wrap out, we end up with pairs. We have two zeros here, two zeros here, two zeros here, so there's six zeros, and then four times 25, four times 25 is 100, with six zeros. What we are looking at, what we are looking at is 100 million pairs of shoes are sold, which is same as 10 raised to 8. The next one, 160. 160 is quite straightforward. In 160 we are given four numbers and we are asked to find the median. That's all it is. Medians of four numbers. The numbers are 10, 4, 26 and 16. And since we have even number of numbers, of course the median is going to be the average of the middle two. So we just have to arrange them in order. Let's do that. We have the 4 which is the smallest one. Then we have a 10. Then we have a 16. And then we have 26. There you go. So the median is simply the average of these two. 10 plus 16 divided by 2. 10 plus 16 is 26. 26 divided by 2. The median is 13. That's all it is. Number 161. Number 161. We are told that we have three bags. We have three bags, P, Q, and R. And we are told the total number of marbles that we have in the bags are as follows. 37, X, 32. And this is the percentage of blue marbles. Percentage of blue marbles is 10.8, and 50%. We are further told that one third one third of total are blue. We are told that one third of the total marbles are blue. The question simply is how much is this x? Let's see what we can do. Since we know that one third, since we are told that one third of all the marbles are blue, Here's the total, 37 plus x plus 32. 37 plus x plus 32, a third of that has to be blue. But then we are also told the percentage of blue marbles in each bag. 10.8% is approximately 11%. 10% of, 10 of 37 is 3.7. Uh, 10 of 37 is 3.7. And then 11% will be 3.7 plus 0.37 is approximately 4. Is approximately 4. 66.7% of x is simply two-thirds of x and half of 32 is 16. There we go. And this, rep this represents the number of blue marbles and so does this one which means we equate the two. 4 plus two-thirds x plus 16. Let's multiply the entire equation by 3. And when we do that these three drops out. 30 plus 30 is 60, 7 plus 2 is 9, so it's 69 plus x equals 
this is 12, this is 48. 48 plus 10 is 58, plus 2 is 60. So it's 60 plus 2 times x is 2x. There you go. And therefore x equals to, bring the x to this side, bring 60 to this side, and x equals to 9. Very simple, very straightforward. Number 162. In 162, we are told that these are the ages and these are the number of employees that who fall in each of the categories of ages. People who are younger than 20, people who are in their 20s, people who are in their 30s, people who are in their 40s, the employees who are in their 50s, employees who are in their 60s, and finally, the number of employees who happen to be in their 60s. And these are the numbers. We have 29, 58, 36, 21, 10, 5, and 2. And the question is, what's the, what is the range for median? What is the range for medians? Obviously, they can ask, ask for the precise value for median because we have this range of, of, of ages. So we have to find out in what range does the median fall. Now before we can worry about the, where, where does the median fall, we have to first figure out how many people we have total because the median is the middle number. Before we can worry about what the middle number is, we have to know how many people are there total, which is right here. Let's find it out, shall we? So here we have 2 plus 5 is 7, 7 plus 1 is 8, 8 plus 8 is 16, 16 plus 8 is 24, 24 plus 1 is 25, 25 plus 6 is 31. 1, carry 3, carry 3 and 2 plus 3 is 5, 5 plus 5 is 10, 10 plus 5 is 15, 15 plus 1 is 16. There you go. There are 161 employees, which means 80 employees are going to be on this side, 80 employees are going to be that side, and 81st is the median. And now the question simply is, where does the 81st observation fall? Well, let's see. Here we have 29 employees. Let's, let's pretend it's 30, and here we have 58 employees. 30 plus 58 would, would be 60, because it's 29 and 20, uh, 58, it doesn't make much difference. It's sort of, it's a, 30 plus 60 would, would have been 90, I meant to say. 30 plus 60 would have been 90. Instead of 90, it's 87. There are 87 people in these two categories, which means the 81st observation is going to fall right here, in this range, in the 20s. Median is in the 20s. Median is between 20 and 29. The median age for the employees is going to fall in that range. 163. In 163, we are told that K plus... We are told that K and N are positive integers. We are also told that k is more than n and we are, we are told that k factorial plus n minus k factorial we are told we are rather be, we are being rather rather we are being asked that this quantity that we see here when it is simplified we, we are asked to simplify this quantity as much as we can and when it when it is simplified, when it is fully simplified, the question is which of these five quantities that they give us in the answer choices would match what we find. So let's do that. Here we have k factorials and here we have k minus k minus one factorials. K factorials is the same as k times k minus one factorials. Just like ten factorials of course is equal to ten times nine factorial. K, k factorial is simply k times k minus 1 factorial. And on this side we have n minus k times k minus 1 factorial. As you can see, k minus 1 factorial is common. Let's take it out as a common factor, k minus 1 factorial. And when we take them out common, what we are left from the first quantity here is, is k. What we are left from here is n minus k. There we go. As you can clearly see, k is going to drop out, and it's simply n times this quantity. 
And that's all there is. That's all there is. And that was 163. Let's move on to 164. In 164, in 164 we have three people. We're going to call them R, <coughs> R, B, and A. We are told that R's height, the height of R, is four inches more than the height of A. Ron, Adam, or rather Emmy, Ron, Emmy, and Barbara. Ron's height is four inches more than Adam's height. Well, whatever the Adam's height is, if you were to add four, four more inches to it, we'll get Ron's, Ron's height. Similarly, we are told that Barbara's height is one inch more than Ron. Whatever Ron's height is, if we were to add one more inch to it, we get Barbara's height. We are finally told, we are also told rather, that B happens to be 65. Let's put it this way, B is 65. We are told that it's given, B is 65. The question simply is, what's the median, what's the median age of these three people? Straightforward, simple problem. If B is 65, which means R must be 64. If R is 64, which means A must be 60. There you go. The smallest age is 60. Then we have 64. And then we have 65. Voila. The median is 64. The median age of these three people is 64. 165. In 165, we are told that X and Y are positive number. Pay attention. They're not saying we must pay attention. They're not, we are not being told that they are positive integers. They are positive numbers. They are positive quantities. That's what it says. We are also told that X plus Y has to equal 1. We are given that. That has to equal 1. The question simply is, which could be the value of this quantity 100x plus 200y and the quantities that are given to us are as follows 80, 140, 199 can this quantity can this quantity equal 80? Yes or no? Can this equal 140? Can this equal 199? That's what it is. So let's start with 80. Can this quantity be 80? Well, we know that x plus y has to equal 1, which means, which implies that y has to equal 1 minus x. Let's put it in here. So it's 100x plus 200 times 1 minus x equals 80. Let's open the parentheses. We end up with 200 minus 200x, 100x plus this quantity has to equal 80. 100x and the minus 200x will end up with negative 100x which has to equal 80 minus 200. 80 minus 200 is going to give us negative 120. That's going to give us negative 100, 120. Divide both sides by negative, uh, negative 100 and we find that x will have to equal 1.2. If x equals 1.2, that in turn must imply that y would have to equal negative 0 0.0, 0 0.2. Because they have to add up to 1. If x is 1.2, y would have to be negative 0.2. Which is not possible. Which is not possible because we are told that they are positive numbers. Which means that this quantity that we're looking at, 100x plus 200y, cannot equal 80. It cannot equal 80. Let's move on to the next one. The next question is, can it be 140? Let's find out, shall we? Can it be 140? Can it be 140? Can this quantity be 140? That's what we are interested in. So, that's the question. Can this be 140? That's the question. So all the work is going to be the same, except here is 140. Now, when we bring this 200 now here, 140 minus 200 is going to give us negative 60. Divide both sides by 100, and what we find is that x is equal to 0.6. If x is equal to 0.6, then y must equal 0.4. 
and that works. That works. That works because we fulfill the two conditions that we have here. Well, first condition is that they had a, they have to add up to one. Second is that they both need to be positive, and they are both positive. So that is possible. One forty is possible. Is it possible for this quantity to be one ninety nine? Is it possible for this quantity to be 199? That's the question. Well, if it's 199, then 199 minus 200 will give us negative 0 0.01. Divide both sides by negative 100, and we find that x is equal to 1 over 100, which in turn implies that y must be 99 over 100. And that is also fine. That is also fine. X is, x is equal to 0 0.01, which in turn makes y equals to 0 0.99, which is fine. They both add up to 1, they, they, add, they add up to 1, and they are both positive. It works, which means the correct answer is 2 and 3 only. 2 and 3 only. Answer is E. 166. Oh, I was going to say 166 on next page, but we are already on the next page. One sixty six says that point point one x. We have this quantity where x is the hundredth digit x is the hundredth digit. And then we have another quantity which is point zero two y, where y is the thousandth digit. And the question is, what is the greatest possible value of this quantity? 0.1x and 0.02y. Well, let's find out, shall we? If we want this fraction, if we want this fraction to be as large as possible, there is only one way to go about it. Not, not only this fraction, but for, for that matter, any fraction at all. To be, if you want to make the fra positive fraction, that is, to be as large as possible, we need to make the numerator as large as possible and denominator as small as possible. That will maximize this value. The largest value that x can assume, because x represents the 100 digit, is 9. 0.19. This is as large as we can get. The smallest value that y can assume, it cannot be 0 because if it were 0 it would just be 0 0.02. The smallest value it can assume is 0 0.021. To line up the to line up the digits, I'm going to insert a zero here. And now just multiply top and bottom by 1000. And when we do that, what we find is that this quantity, this quantity right here, boils down to 190 over 21. 190 over 21 is clearly less than 10. It's clearly less than 10 because 10 times 21 is 210 obviously and this quantity obviously is less than 210. Is it, is it, is it more than 9 or is it equal to 9? Let's find out. 21 times 9. Let's find out where, where we fall with that one. 21 times 9 would be 9 and then 18. There you go. 9 21s are 189 which means, which means that this quantity 190 over 21 is exactly equal to 9 and 1 and 21. Because we have a 189 with a remainder of 1. Therefore, since the answer choices are given in integers, what number was this? 166. It says, which of the following is the closest, greatest possible value of this quantity? And the answer choice, among the answer choices that we have, the answer is 9. That's the greatest possible value. Do you understand? And that's all it is. Obviously it can be 4, 5 or 6, but that's, those are not the greatest possible values. And it cannot be 10, because it's clearly 
less than 10. One sixty seven. In one sixty seven, we are told that we have twelve teams. I'm not going to write everything on the blackboard. We have twelve teams, and we are told that they're going to play against each other. Twelve teams play against each other. Only once. Only once. The question is, how many games are possible? Well, 12 teams, which means the, game, the match is going to be between 12, first, this, this, uh, first place is 12, times 11. Because a team, a team cannot play against itself. So the number of matches that we can have is 12 times 11. But that's not it. That's only half the story. We also must understand that here, Order does not matter. This is a combination problem. Order does not matter because once a match is being played between A and B, a match between A and B is the exact same match as the one that is being played between B and A. Order does not matter. This is a combination problem, which means this, these are the possibilities here, 12 times 11, and we must take half of that. We must take half of that. Do you understand? To account for the fact that a uh, uh, combination of A, B is same as B, A. This is not a permutation. Order does not matter. There you go. That's our answer. 66 is the answer. If you have 12 teams, then all together we're going to have 66 matches between these two te teams if they play against each other only once. 168. In 168, we are told that we have a square. We have a square, obviously all four sides are equal. And we are told that in this square, this is a square here, in this square we are told that the length of diagonal is 2 times root x. The question is this, the question is, what is the area of this guy? What's the area of this square? Let's call these sides, let's just call these sides A, and let's apply the Pythagorean theorem. It's a simple Pythagorean theorem, because obviously these are all 90 degree angles, all of them. So we can use the Pythagorean theorem, which tells us that A squared plus A squared has to equal the square of the hypotenuse, which is 2 times root x whole squared which boils down to 2a squared equals equal to 2 squared is going to be 4 and this square of x square root of x is just going to be x divide both sides by 2 there you go which means a squared equals 2 times x and that is our answer because a squared a squared represents the area area of the square the sides are a and a is simply a squared which we just found out to be, to be 2x Number 169. In 169, we're going to choose four books out of ten. At random, obviously. I'm not going to write it there at random. And we're going to list them in order. Since we are listing them in order, order matters obviously. The question is, if I'm going to choose four books to read, how many different ways can I read these four books that I'm going to read if I were to pick ten, uh, four, of the, four of these books that I'm going to read out of ten books that I have in front of me? Well, since there are ten, since there are ten books and I'm going, to, I'm going to read four of them, how many different ways can I pick the first book? Obviously, ten of them, because there are ten of them. Once I have picked the first book, how many different ways can I pick a second book? Obviously, nine of them, because I'm not going to pick, put back the book that I picked first time, because I'm not going to reread it. I'm reading four different books, obviously. How many different books can I read the third? How many different ways can I pick the third book? 
8 different ways because there are only 8 left because I already picked 2. How many different ways can I pick this last book? The answer is 7 times. There you go. 10 times 9 is 90 and 7, 7, 7 squared is 49. 49 plus 7 is 56. So it's 90 times 56. You could sit there and do it out, exact, exact calculation. But whenever you run into a situation like this, whenever you run into a situation like this where you find yourself doing some awkward calculation, it's always a good idea. It must, you must always, always, always take a quick glance at the answer choices to see how far apart are the answer choices laid out. I'm, I'm doing and, uh, and looking at the book at the same time. And if you look at the answer choices, we have 6, 40, 200, 5,000, and 151,000. There you go. Which is, which is your cue that you don't have to do the exact calculation. They, all, they, are, they are all very far apart. Let's approximate. I'm going to approximate 90 as 100 and I'm going to approximate that as 50. So approximately 5,000 different ways I can pick my four books out of the 10 possible books that I have in front of me. That's all it is. Number 170. In 170 we are told that n is a positive integer and we are told that the product of all integers 1 to n inclusive, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to write it, but inclusive which means we start with 1 and end at n. We are told that product of all the integers from 1 to n is divisible by 990. What we want to find out is what is the least least possible value of n. What's the smallest number of integers that I can have, 1 through n that is, and still find myself that the product of these integers divide evenly by 990. Let's see what we can do. So we're going to we're going to make up an integers. So let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. Okay? Maybe we have one times two times three, and and we don't know how many. We'll find out in a second. And we want to find out if this is divisible by nine ninety. Well, this is too small. We can clearly see this is this is nowhere close to nine ninety. So let's go a little bit more. How about four and five? Let's see if that does the job. We have a 5 and we have a 2. 5 times 2 is 10. That goes away. Divide top and bottom by 3. 3 is going to go away and 99 becomes 33. There you go. It's 33. There is our cube. 33 is a product of two prime numbers 3 and 11. Which means that we must go all the way up to 11. So here we have 6 times 7 times 9 times 11 so forth. And now it will divide evenly. Because we have 11 here. Uh, we have 33 here. We have 33 here, and now we can do our job. 33 will divide by 11 three times, and then this 3 can go into 6 two times. There you go. Which means the product of 1 through 11, when it's divided by 990, it divides evenly. And the answer is exactly 14. Oh, 14 times 4, that is. With no remainder, obviously, it divides evenly. So the least possible value of n is 11. Is it possible for n to be 12? Of course the product of 1 through 12 will also divide by 990 and so will the product of 1 through 12 billion but the smallest possible value of n is 11 171 171 in 171 we are told that we have two events we are going to event m event M and event R. But they are not giving us the odds of these events happening. Rather we are given the odds of these events not happening. And this is how we show it. The probability that M will not happen, M will not happen, we put a bar on top of it to indicate that it's the probability of something not happening. We are told the probability that M will not happen is 0.8 which in turn implies that the probability that M will happen is 20%. You understand? We are further told that the probability that event R will not take place is 0.6, which in turn implies that the probability that R will happen must be 40%. 
we are further told we are further told that M M and R cannot occur at the same time. The event M and R cannot occur simultaneously. The question is how do we write it? How do we write it in the language of math? This is how we write it. This tells us that the probability that M and N will occur at the same time, M and R order, is zero. Because we are told they cannot, they cannot occur. So the odds that they will both happen is zero. If you want to understand in terms of Venn diagram, this is what it looks like. Here we have M and R, event M and event R, and this area represents the odds that they will both happen at the same time, and that is zero. The odds that M will, that M will happen is 20%, because this is a zero, and odds that R will happen is 40%. Therefore, the odds, I never told you what we're looking for, what are the odds that either M or R will happen? What are the odds that either M or R will happen? Well, M has a 20% chance of happening, R has a 40% chance of happening, it is simply 60%. It's just 20 plus 40, there's nothing to it. That was the end of that page, that was the last question on that page. It seems like a logical place to stop here. So we're going to stop right here, we'll meet again tomorrow, we're going to pick up from where we left off, as always. In the meantime, if you wish to get hold of me, if you would like to work with me, if you would like to hire my services to help you get ready for the exam, you can reach me by sending me an email, just go to my website at kashpaniprev.com and from there you can, you'll be able to send me an email. From there you will also be able to fill out a form if, that's, if that is what you wish. Fill out the form tell, if you wish to tell me a little bit more about yourself and we'll talk some more. Alright, I'll see you tomorrow. Bye now.